Welcome to the Books on Air podcast. I'm Suzanne Harris, and on our podcast, we talk to the authors about themselves, their books, and their ideas. Every book has two stories, and if you listen to this podcast, you find out the backstory behind every book. Joining me today is Melissa Farrell, and she's here to talk about her marvelous book, 12 Years in Alaska, A Spiritual Journey. Now, Melissa began her studies in many of the ancient and current wisdom teachings, communications, and psychology following an accident that resulted in a near-death experience. She attended classes with her mentor, Wally Skaggs, for nearly a decade. She was on the founding board of a church whose philosophy was based on her teachings. She worked at the family-owned psychiatric facility for 10 years. She received a bachelor's degree from Johnson College, University of Redlands, and a master's degree in comparative religions and ordination from the Aquarian Star Temple and Wisdom School. I can't tell you, Melissa, what a pleasure it is to welcome you to Books on Air. I told you from the moment I got you on the phone that I couldn't wait to talk to you. Welcome, and let's get started. Thank you so much for this opportunity, and I really am looking forward to this conversation. It's just so interesting, and as I said to you, I am so glad that you're here because this is when we talk about the near-death experience. That's in the very beginning of the book, and I told you that I was right there with you and your brother when this all happened. But I want to start a little before then. I want to start talking about you a little bit. One of the things that I was curious about is that in the beginning of the book, you talked about, in in the preface, about being born an indigo child. Would you please explain that for me? There's um, There's been a big shift in the energy of the universe, and uh, I noticed this first um, with a child that, uh, you know, a, a friend of mine, uh, his, her, his, her son had a, chi- uh, a child, okay, and and the way that I see things, I could see this special light around this child. And and it just astounded me. And then I got pregnant with my own son. And here was another one of what I called the light children. It was for it took a lot of years, but I ran across um, a PMH Atwater book written about the indigo children. And it's the color of of um, that generation has has an aura that she sees. <laughs> and How so that's yeah. Those are the indigo children, and they're very special. They're very special, um, and they've been around for a long time. You know, um, my son is now forty three years old. You know, <laughs> <laughs> right? Not two and a half. <laughs> and and there is an, and there is another been another shift and so his children are crystal end quote crystal children again there's they're they're just a little different their energy is different it's clearer does that make sense to you yeah sure it does yeah you're an empath and you can see those auras right. Uh, empaths feel more than anything, but I can uh, I don't see auras necessarily. I I can't explain how it is that I see people, but I register it diff- people differently, and I can see them in shades usually of light and dark. You and I talked before we came on about that. We talked about as a child when your mother read to you that she yeah. didn't just hear the words and you didn't just let it the story wash over you that you actually see the movie in your head. You see pictures in your head. Is that right? That's correct. Yes, I do. 
I, you know, especially when I'm reading. <laughs> and you and I are both like that. We both do that. I see pictures in my head as well. Now, I'm a former dancer. I guess you're never a former dancer. You're always a dancer. It's in your soul. But I see choreography. I see pictures whenever I'm writing. I see pictures whenever I'm reading. And I see choreography when I hear certain kinds of music because I've been involved in ballet and dance since I was a, a child, like seven or eight years old. Started teaching when I was 15. And I just assumed that everyone saw pictures in their head. I didn't understand that they didn't. Yeah, most most people that I know don't. Uh, don't. Yeah, it's that's really special. And and yeah, I started seeing pictures in my head with mom reading poetry to me when when I was tiny, you know. <laughs> I'm curious about the backstory behind the book because the the not near death experience incident happened in 1964. Yeah, you I was lived fit- life. Moved to Alaska in 1995, spent 12 yeah. years there, came back to California. When did the book declare itself that it wanted to be written? When I left Alaska, I, I did so reluctantly. Alaska is my heart home, still is. Um, but my sister, my older sister, was taking care of our mom who was having uh, little mini strokes and her brain was being destroyed and oh. she needed help. You know, she needed help. Yeah. My, my sister needed help taking care of mom. So I just, that's when I left Alaska. I got down, you know, Alaska is up above Canada, basically. Driving down, down the Alcan, I was about... I'd say two miles north of the Canadian border when all of a sudden this book started writing in my head. And and I continued down <laughs> wow. in, into the United States with this book writing itself in my head. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I get it. I mean, I, yeah. I get it. Sometimes that writing process just comes it's just there yeah it yeah. is just there yes yeah. so i don't want i don't want us to be nebulous with our listeners let's give them an overview of the book because this all starts with the near death experience and let's go ahead and tell them why is it called 12 years in alaska a spiritual journey okay so let's start there um the 12 years in Alaska were important because I am an empath. I was born an empath, and I lived in San Diego County with, you know, probably better than 100,000 people there, and I would absorb everything that, of all of the people that were around me and, and, couldn't, and couldn't differentiate between what, I, what was me and what was them. It took a lot of years, uh, uh, you know, counseling and, uh, you know, the, one of the reasons I got into psychology was to try to figure this stuff out, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, my younger sister moved, married uh, a man that was stationed in Eielson Air Force Base in Alaska. We went up, my mother and my son and I, one year to see to visit with her and see the place. Mama decided that that um, Alaska would be a good place for me, and I absolutely, like we, we you know, absolutely did. Uh, when we made that that trip, we uh, we were driving along the number two highway in in Alaska. Got to this one space, my heart space opened up absolutely wide. And I said to my sister, Terry, where are we? And she said, this is Salcha, Alaska. And that's where I ended up living. It's because there were only 900 people living in Salcha. It struck out over 35 miles down the highway and about 5 or 10 miles on either side of the Tanana River. There was, so I could hear me, I could feel me, I could, you know, deal with my own issues in that 12 years. For the first time? For the first time. Because there was quiet? Yeah. 
because, because there was quiet around me and I could get to know who I am. And that's when I started expanding on who I wanted to grow up to be, if that makes sense to you. It does. Yeah. So by the time that I started back, in, you know, towards California, um, I know pretty much who I was. But this is a continuing story, uh, or not story, it's a continuing journey of my expression. So I am not the same person I was when I left Alaska, but I think that I'm a much better person than I was also. The way that you've put the book together is really interesting. I thought when I first started to read it that it was an autobiography. And from what you just said, our listeners would probably draw that same conclusion. But that's not what this is. It's very different from that. You've written a series of 30 articles. I know because I counted them. (laughs) Yeah. And they fall into three different categories. For whom were the articles originally written? Were they, was that what, how you wrote the book? And over what period of time did it take you to put these 30 articles together? And then let's also talk about the categories that you have them divided into. Okay, well, the categories are awareness, anomalies, and maunderings. Okay, and okay. They're, and they each have a like a different character. The awareness are actually the the uh, based on some of the classes that I took. A lot of the classes that I took. Some of it was just you know the insights that I had, but mostly those are teachings that I wanted to share because they they those are the things that provided me with a foundation to work from when I was in Alaska doing my spiritual journey. Okay. okay. Um, uh, the anomalies are unusual experiences that I had. Well, I mean, I'm putting unusual in quotes. Things like um, seeing ghosts, for instance. You know, uh, black dogs of depression was. Uh, um, this is a from one of the residents that we had at the ranch. This is what what she called them: the black dogs of depression. And uh, there's one article in there where, uh, you know, I explain about the black dogs of depression that were, well, actually, they were black dogs that were charging the car that I was driving. You saw them? (laughs) Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know. Um, And uh, the Mondrings are the the kind of things that the... Uh, oh, you know what maundering is? No. It's like if you're if you're walking if you're walking on a path through a forest that kind of winds back and forth and back and forth, that's maundering. Ah. Okay. So these these are you know I- different insights and thoughts and you know that kind of stuff like that. So it's like, that's why I, and I and I've got them you know each of the articles is labeled as to to what category it falls into. Over what period of time? Did you write these down? Well, as I, uh, you know, I started, the story started itself when I was driving down, okay? I didn't have time to write them until I got all the way down into uh, California again and uh, found a place to live and blah, 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 okay? and mm-hmm. But I had scribbled some notes, and uh, and I just kind of, you know, typed them up on the computer as much as I could and put them away, it w- and I went to work, and I worked as a bookkeeper. Could not write when I was working with, a, you know, f- between five and seven days a week as right. a bookkeeper. They frown on that when they're paying you, don't they? <laughs> yeah, it's hard to switch between the right and left brain that easily. <laughs> yes, I agree. <laughs> So I retired, um, I think it was in, in uh, 2019, if I recall correctly, I retired from the bookkeeping position. And it took about another three months before all of a sudden here the book is starting to write itself again. And that's when I started really writing it. You know. Uh, so 
it, it took a long time, but it only took me probably about a year and a half to wow. write, actually write the book and get it edited. You know, it's just, it's so interesting to hear about someone's writing process and how it all works because the creative mind is such a fascinating topic to talk about. Mm. And I know that those, those, those people among us who have never decided they were going to write a book or never tried to write a short story or have never done tried to do anything creative like that, even though it's, this is a fact-based book, it still requires that same kind of creative process, if you will. Yes. When you were going yes. through this, did you learn anything surprising about yourself? Did anything surprising happen? Not particularly. Um, you know, I would say the hardest time that I had with a book was cutting it down. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Because when you, you know, first start writing, you write everything. Yeah. Yeah. And then getting through the editing process, I have a particular style, um, which is, I think of as my voice, um, which I use by punctuation. This is something that I started doing when I was, uh, gosh, I don't know, probably sixth or seventh grade. I had developed this style of writing. You're talking about the capitalization and the small letters of the same word like self and self, aren't you? Um, that part of that, it's also the, you know, uh, hyphens, the, uh, you know, the longer ones that, you know, um, uh, you know, that show a pause. This is, this is like if you're, if I was talking to you, I would make this pause to come up with the next word because it emphasizes that word. You, th you know, that's what I'm talking about, my style. It's a little different. I had a little problem with my editor about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't do that. I, this is how I wanted to say it. Yeah, I can understand <laughs> that. I can understand yeah. that completely. Yeah. You know, let's give... I know that the listeners are curious about the near-death experience. And how did that oh, leave oh. you? What What are the... I guess in your future life... What echoes come back from that near-death experience? Because that has to be something that once that kind of impact comes into your life, it, it, it's like dropping a rock in a pond. The, the concentric circles have to never stop. Would you tell our, our listeners about that experience? I, you know, it, it, yeah, you're absolutely right in one sense. In another sense, not so much. Um, uh, it, the near-death experience changes everything so, so much that that it isn't a matter of growing through it and learning it little by little. I mean, you have the experience and everything has changed. And, and I mean physically, emotionally, spiritually, um, you know, everything. Your, your outlook on life, everything changes. In that split second. Coping with that is another issue. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it is. I mean, it, I, well, because I, you, it's like you could become a different person. Yeah, that makes perfect sense yeah. to me. Because yeah. you've had an experience that not everyone has. I mean, I, I confess, I've never had a near death experience like that. I, as I read through the first part of that, this is a car accident that you had with your brother. And yeah. you have written it so well, and this is a compliment from, from me to you about your writing. You have written it so well that I was right there in the front seat with you and John. I saw through your eyes everything that you described that happened. And as you were in the hospital, as you were going through the recovery, your writing, your prose is so clear and well written that you will pull, you will reach out and you grab hold of the lapel of the reader, and you pull that reader right into your story so that they're with you looking through your eyes and seeing exactly what you saw and what happened. It make me cry. Thank you. Oh, I didn't mean to make you cry. It's just that's, very that's powerful. Huge. No, no, no. 
happy, happy tears, happy tears. Good, thank you, because it was. I found it very powerful. What do you think the themes are that go through the thirty articles? Themes. I mean, you know, I'm I'm not sure I can talk about themes. What I'm doing is is sharing what I learned through my years that I think other people would benefit from if they would be willing to look into it. Right. And my so my hope is that that uh, a reader will find something, even if it's just one thing out of that book, that helps them find their own life path. So many of us are so affected by our upbringing and our environment that we don't really know who we truly are. Oh, especially and, in this day and time. Don't you think people are very lost right now? And angry and fearful. Yes, yes. all of those things. Yes. Yeah. yes, absolutely. The cover of the book, there's a photograph that's absolutely magnificent. Is there is there some semblance or is there some uh, symbolic reference to this mountain and what is it? Okay, this this is a um, a, a picture. It's a, and it and it wraps. Okay, because this is in a mountain range. But uh, when when I was living in Alaska, I worked in Fairbanks and I lived in Salter, which was to the south. Okay, and every and I shopped in Fairbanks too because Salter was really tiny. Um, and I would go down along the Eielson Air Force Base flight line, uh, and this this peak would be framed between the tall, skinny trees. Oh. Okay, and it was and and it reminded me, you know how breathtaking Mount Fuji is for so many people, right? Okay, there's this that's there's this kind of symmetry to to that, that particular peak. It's called Mount Barbara. And it just so happened that the publisher that I use for my book had uh, different designs for colors and uh, covers, you know. And I went through, t you know, I can't tell you how many, and all of a sudden here is this picture of, of Mount Barbara. Oh, wow. So that's the way I picked it. <laughs> Serendipitous. That was like kind of bringing a piece of Alaska to my readers. <laughs> you know, that's exactly how I interpreted it. That's exactly what I thought. I looked at that and I thought, well, this has to be in Alaska. It just yes. has to be. It looks like it. Yes. Yeah. And I've seen Denali and Denali is impressive. Okay. But I prefer Mount Barbara. There's just personal. something about it, isn't there? There's, yes, there is. Yes, and I think it has to do with the symmetry of the, of the peak itself. Yeah. Well, this is just a fascinating book, and I'm sure that our listeners by now are going, okay, okay, stop talking. Tell me where I can find this book. It's on Amazon, so let me do a little titling and a little spelling so that you could find it easily. Just go to Amazon, and they have a drop-down menu if you've never done that. Just there's a list where they start listing things. If you'll just click on that little downward arrow, books will come up. Make sure that you put books in your in your search feature. Here is the title of Melissa's book. It's Twelve Years in Alaska Colon A Spiritual Journey by Melissa M E L I S S A L, letter L, period, Farrell, F-A-R-R-E-L-L. -L. Put that in your search feature. Click on it. The book will come right up. You'll see that gorgeous photograph of Mount Barbara right there on the cover. Click on it, and it's available in paperback. It's available in hardback and, it, and in Kindle. Now, I know that there's also a way to get to the excerpt. In the upper right-hand corner, you'll see words that say, open here, or something to that effect. I didn't know what that meant. 
If you'll put your cursor on those two words right there on the representation of the cover and just click, the book will open up and you'll get to read an excerpt from the book. And it just so happens that it's it's what we've been talking about. It's the near-death experience and Barbara being in the hospital. You'll see what I mean about her writing, how she pulls you right in. Now, Barbara, I know that Barbara, listen to me, I've got Mount Barbara on my mind, so <laughs> Melissa, I've decided to call you Barbara. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Shift, shift. All right, Melissa. <laughs> Melissa, I know that, that sometimes people don't want to buy their books from the largest bookseller in the world. The book is available some other places. Let's give them a list of the few where they can find it. Um, I know that they can can find it at Barnes and Noble. I have gone up myself and and seen that there are about five other places that are carrying it, uh, but I don't remember the names. So I would recommend that what they want to do is to, if they want to buy it someplace else, is to run a search on the internet. Just put your name in the Google. Book. Just put your name in uh, Google. Well, you have to do the same thing. Um, you know. Uh, 12 years in Alaska, Melissa L. Farrell, because there's a lot of other Melissa L. Farrells on there. <laughs> I'm sure there is. Now, yeah. <laughs> they could get it from your website, right? Uh, yes, they can also get onto my, onto my website, and there is a button where they can buy it, and that will be through uh, my publisher. Let's give them your website address. Okay, my web address is um, the number 12, oh, this, you know, this is www, okay, the number 12, year, years, pardon me, Y-E-A-R-S-A-K-M-L-F-A-R-R-E-L-L dot com. No spaces, right? No spaces, and and the letters are all lower class, uh, or lower case, not class. <laughs> <laughs> They might be offended, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> but the yeah, but the twelve is are, are the numerals one, two, one and two. Yeah. Now, when so they go to it. when they go to your website, they can not only buy a copy of the book, but you also have a blog on your website as well. Tell me about that. Uh, I'm doing blogging. Yes, uh, it's a, it's a little slow um, because I have a lot of stuff going on in my life anyway. <laughs> For somebody who is retired. Uh, um, part of, you know, part of it is, uh, has to do with something about the book, you know, with something that would have been in the book, okay, but it, but it wasn't. Sometimes they're, they're just quotes. Um, I, you know, one of the longer articles that's in there actually is a duplicate of one of the articles in the book itself. It just has a slightly different title to it. Uh, and I'm on the pro- in the process of working on another blog um, right well this week. Basically, I hope to get it done. It takes me a while to write things. <laughs> you know? Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with yeah. how long the creative process takes. Now we're really about out of our time, unfortunately. But I yeah. always like to give an author the opportunity to have the last word about their writing, especially when their writing is as powerful as yours is. When the readers, when our listeners become readers and they pick up a copy of 12 Years in Alaska and they sit down and they begin to read it, I know this is not, this is not a romance book. This is a book that you'll sit down and you'll read and then you'll think about what you've read and then you'll read more and you'll think about what you've read. But you will eventually come to that last page, and you will eventually read that last page and close the back cover. When the reader closes the back cover, Melissa, what's the bottom line message that you want them to take away? My hope for the reader is that they will find something in in one or more of the articles that help them to... Find their own private, personal path in life. That's what the, that's what this whole experience of my life has been for me was to find the path that is right for me in life. And I just wanted to 
give the opportunity to people to maybe find their own. I, I really love the book, and I love your writing, and I am so glad that you and I have had the opportunity to talk. It's just been a pleasure to have you on Books on Air today. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I've enjoyed it tremendously. Now remember, you can find 12 Years in Alaska, A Spiritual Journey by Melissa L. Farrell at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Google it, and you can find it some other places as well. You've been listening to the Books on Air podcast brought to you on webtalkradio.net. You can also hear this podcast on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, and Apple Podcasts. I'm Suzanne Harris, and I so hope you'll join us for our next Books on Air podcast because remember, you never know who's going to be here, and you never know who we're going to talk to. Thank you so very much for listening.